Good morning. I want to welcome everyone this morning. Uh, it's good to see everyone here, and I know it's a little, little cold outside, a little snowy, so uh, I'm sure we have a few more folks that are tuning in online, so I want to welcome you as well. Uh, it's good to be able to gather together and to, and to worship uh, and to just uh, lift up our voices and, and celebrate that we serve a risen Savior, and I think uh, that that is the most blessed thing ever, to know that we serve a God who is willing to send his son live a perfect life, die for our sins, and raise again. He sits at the right hand of him today, and we celebrate that. So let's do that this morning and stand together as we sing Lift Up Your Voices. Lift up your voices with the shout of victory. Father God, we do lift up our voices this morning. Father, praising you, and Father, just knowing that we have come here to worship. Father, that we don't just worship on Sunday, but each and every day. And Lord, I just thank you for the freedom that we have to do so. And I just ask, Lord, a blessing upon this service this morning. As we sing to you, as the men bring the meditations and Kevin brings the sermon, Father, help our hearts to be receptive and focused upon you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
be seated. Continuing to worship, heart of worship. When the music fades, all is stripped away. take the opportunity to remember what Christ did on Calvary for us. So as we prepare for our communion time this morning, let's be singing Lamb of God.
I'd like to start this morning by offering a sincere thank you to all that participated in my little game a couple weeks ago. I really appreciate all the listening. And congratulations to Ben for being first with the answer. Yeah, I know, he had a little advantage as he was right behind me. But good job to all that participated and made it seem not too arduous. <laughs> Yesterday, the word was gargoyle. So I figured that would be a little too obvious, so we're not going to play again. As we come to the communion time of our service, I would like to share something that some of you may have seen or shared on Facebook this week. I thought it was pretty good as a few of the items hit home for me personally. See if any apply to you also. You don't have to raise your hand, just think about them. It's called Church is Hard, and it was posted originally by Pat Smith. It's a reminder that even though I think this place is pretty awesome, some people might have obstacles in it or towards it. And we should be aware of that fact when trying to win them for the Lord. Again, church is hard. Church is hard for the person walking through the doors afraid of judgment. Church is hard for the pastor's family under the microscope of an entire body. Church is hard for the prodigal soul returning home broken and battered by the world. Church is hard for the girl who looks like she has it all together, but doesn't. Church is hard for the couple who fought the entire ride to service. Church is hard for the single mom surrounded by couples holding hands and seemingly perfect families. Church is hard for the widow and the widower with no invitation to lunch after service. Church is hard for the deacon with an estranged child. Church is hard for the person singing worship songs overwhelmed by the weight of the lyrics. Church is hard for the man insecure in his role as a leader. Church is hard for the wife who longs to be led by a righteous man. Church is hard for the nursery worker volunteer who desperately longs for a baby to love. Church is hard for the single woman and single man praying God gives them a mate. Church is hard for the teenage girl wearing a scarlet letter ashamed of her mistakes. Church is hard for sinners. Church is hard for me. It's hard because on the outside it all looks shiny and perfect. Sunday best in behavior and dress. However, underneath those layers, you find a body of imperfect people, carnal souls, selfish motives. But here is the beauty of church. Church isn't a building, mentality, or expectation. Church is a body. Church is a group of sinners saved by grace, living in fellowship as saints. Church is a body of believers bound as brothers and sisters by an eternal love. Church is a holy ground where sinners stand as equals before the throne of grace. Church is a refuge for broken hearts and a training ground for mighty warriors. Church is a converging of confrontation and invitation where sin is confronted and hearts are invited to seek restoration. Church is a lesson in faith and trust. Church is a bearer of burdens and a giver of hope. Church is a family, a family coming together, setting aside differences, forgetting past Mistakes, rejoicing in the smallest of victories. Church, the body, and the circle of sinners turned saints is where he resides. And if we ask, he is faithful to come. So even on the hard days at church, the days when I am at odds with a friend, when I fought with my husband because we're late once again, when I've walked in bearing burdens heavier than my heart can handle, yet masking the pain with a smile on my face, when I've worn a scarlet letter under the microscope, when I've longed for a baby to hold or fought tears as the lyrics were sung, when I've walked back in afraid and broken after walking away, I'll remember he has never failed to meet me there. End quote. I think we should view those obstacles to church kind of like we do apologetics, as 1 Peter 3.15 states, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have but do this with gentleness and respect. We need to be prepared to handle those types of obstacles in the same manner. Hebrews 10, 23 to 25, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how we may spur one, and on, one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. We need to continue working to get people here, to get them on our side, to learn the truth of God's word, and so that we can share in this communion with as many people as possible. 
Acts 2.42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Just know, some things that may have been hard for Jesus, too. He was tempted and tested, like in Matthew chapter 4, but he still managed to live a life free of sin. Isaiah 53.5, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his words, We are healed. Wounds, we are healed. We rejoice in and remember that sacrifice with these emblems that we are about to partake in. No matter the obstacles or how hard it might be at times, we have the example that we need in Jesus Christ and the life he lived. I'll close with Ephesians 3, 20 to 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for the opportunity to gather here before you this morning and partake in this communion together. Please bless these emblems and all who partake. Help us to overcome all the obstacles that may exist in our lives and in the church so that we may focus on you and grow in your kingdom. Thank you for all that you do, for your, and for your son Jesus, who took our sins on that cross. In his name I pray, amen. As we continue to worship this morning, let's stand together and sing, Count Your Many Blessings. So I'm going to blame it on the cold weather. I'm going to call it brain freeze as I walked out again without my iPad. So I'm stuck with my phone. So we'll see if my eyes read well.
Well, the good thing is I can bring it up uh, as close as I want, so there is that. <laughs> so we come to the offering time and remember uh, just, you know, what, what God's blessed us with and how many blessings that, that he's given us. And uh, I thought Bob said it really well last week during his offering meditation. And so I just wanted to kind of provide a list. Uh, it's a list that came across benefits of giving tithes and offerings. So there are 50, no, there's only eight that I have down. <laughs> tithes and offerings come with a myriad of benefits, and here are a few. Cultivating a generous spirit. Giving from your income helps you cultivate a more generous spirit in general with your time, your home, and your compassion. Number two, expressing gratitude. It's impossible to say, I don't have enough when you give. Giving helps you become grateful for what's already yours. Experiencing joy. Giving helps you experience joy. In fact, generosity has been linked to higher levels of, quote, happy chemicals, unquote, in your brain. Number four, developing trust in God. To give, you need to trust that you will be provided for. In other words, you need to trust God. Number five, supporting the church and community in a practical way. Giving helps you support the church and the community. Most of us know that running a church requires money for building payments, payroll. We don't have building payments, by the way, um, thankfully. Yes, amen to that. But we do have bills. Um, <laughs> payroll, ministry expenses, and more. Six, experiencing spiritual growth. Giving is an act of obedience. It will stretch you, but ultimately, you'll experience more spiritual growth in Christ. Seven, storing up treasures in heaven. The Bible says, store up treasures in heaven rather than on earth, Matthew 6, 19. In other words, giving has eternal significance that goes far beyond the monetary satisfaction of acquiring possessions. And eight, inviting God's blessing. When you give, you invite God's blessing in your life. You see, God owns everything. Everything is already his. So we are just stewards. So let's just give what we've decided today in our heart to give, not under compulsion, for, because God loves a cheerful giver. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, I thank you so much for uh, the many blessings that you give us. I thank you so much for the, the blessings of, uh, that the brothers and sisters here uh, contribute, Father, with, with time, with talents, with tithes. Father, help us to continue to give and to support. Uh, Father, help us to be a light for you. Um, Father, in our lives, the folks we come in contact with, that we just show your love. Father, we thank you for the love that you've given us, and we just ask now, uh, I ask a blessing upon the offerings that, will, that are given this morning, and just ask that they be used to further your work uh, here in the community, in the state, the nation, and throughout the world. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning. I'm going to ask that we uh, add Wyatt to our prayer list. Craig's talking about church is hard and it's hard to come into church when it's cold and windy and icy and you have crutches and you're trying to get up. I'm watching him come up the ramp while Craig's saying church is hard. So keep that in prayer for his injury. Um, also, wanted, I want to take a moment here uh, to walk with you through some slides. We are leaving, Denise and I are leaving next Saturday, and uh, this is a ministry, a mission we've never been to before. Uh, the folks in Africa, uh, it's a mission that we met at International Conference on Missions in Columbus a couple years ago, and we were supporting a little girl who is in school there, and these are the, the images. You can see it's in Kenya, and we will be on the far west coast of Kenya, about six kilometers, they said, from Lake Victoria. So that's where we're going to be going, and then we'll just cycle through these to the next one. Some of them I have words on, some of them I don't, but I just got all these from their Facebook page. We've never been there, but it looks beautiful at sunrise, so that's that one. Uh, that's a picture of some of the staff and the students who are just on their Facebook page. What's that one? That's the staff of the Children's Center. 
classroom. That's an elementary classroom where they go to school. Uh, one of the dorms where the junior high girls, where they live. Mission team dorm. I don't know if that's exactly the room we're going to stay in or not, but it could be. They're working on the, the dining area where we will uh, have meals. I know one of the last projects they were putting up screens in those windows. The nurse in their compound. That's, I don't know what kind of beans those are. It just says harvesting beans. So uh, that's how they do. And then they're just starting a, a community store where they have supplies. So. Uh, we did put a list uh, we shared online. If you get the flock notes, if you're want wanting to pray along with us, you can use that. There are paper copies out there, but do appreciate your prayers. We'll be gone for the next three Sundays, two weeks. It's from Sunday to Sunday. So appreciate your prayers for that. You may have other needs, blessings. Mark? Yep. Many of us have been there, family members, loved ones, willing to do what needs to be done and resting and exercise and strength for Jennifer's dad, Jerry Jackson, who's at Flint Ridge in Newark. Anything else? Kathy? Okay. Safe travels for David coming back to North Carolina tomorrow. Let's just take some time individually to be praying and speak to the Lord, and then I'll close. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you continue to surround us. You walk beside us. You fill us with your spirit and your strength. When it's cold, when it's hot, when it's dry, when it's wet, Father, there are just an abundance of factors uh, in our lives, whether it's the weather, uh, relationships, uh, material goods and possessions and things that break and frustrate us. Father, we are grateful that we can take these moments. We pray that we can focus again on all that you pour into us, uh, all the ways that you have brought us through difficulties in the past. We pray that we would be able to just continue to draw near to you, that we would continue to be the church, uh, your people, whether we're gathered in this building or another on Sunday or just through the week. Father, we lift up our families uh, before you. We pray that you would just continue to open our eyes to see how you are moving and healing and strengthening. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. I'm just laughing, thinking about it. I don't, I don't know if you've ever heard of the, the, it's called the teddy bear toss goal. So I have a video clip that's just, you can watch this as it unfolds. It's the teddy bear toss goal. Line of the goal, the Phantoms flip to center. Krisky will glove it with his men in deep. He'll play it back to his own zone. Hamanakta up in the middle, Trinjaya trying to split the defense. Wobbling puck right wing, he scores! Let the sweet cuddly mayhem commence! Bob Don Trinjaev scores the teddy bear toss goal. It's plush pandemonium in Hershey. What, what an event. I mean, obviously, look at the Bears. Uh, you know, I've been able to be a part of it a, a handful of times here, but, uh, you know, this doesn't get old. So, you know, watching these Bears come, uh, you know, I heard something earlier that they're trying to get over 90,000. Um, you know, they're still flying. Just looking, what a, what a sight! It's unbelievable. <laughs> I, just, I don't know how many times I've watched it. I just laugh. Let the sweet, cuddly mayhem commence. It is plush pandemonium in Hershey. <laughs> just keep that in mind, because we're pretty much going the complete opposite direction from that now. Um, we're we're going to spend a lot of time talking about mean people. Uh, not teddy bears, uh, 
cruel, callous comments, spiteful leaders. So I'm, I started with that teddy bear goal ju just to remind us that not everybody is combative all the time. <laughs> people can care about other people. Some, sometimes to that degree where some 10,000 765 hockey fans would toss 74,599 stuffed animals over the glass onto the ice to be given to kids who have needs and trauma. You know. And that struck me. The, the idea that they have 75,000 kids every year that's in central Pennsylvania, the Hershey area, alone, who have those needs where they take stuffed animals on trauma and cases like that. Yeah. That, that kind of put me right back into the why, why should I ever want to take a stand? And some of the genesis for this sermon is uh, tomorrow's holiday, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Oh, um, we're we're going to talk about having run-ins with the authorities. Martin Luther King Jr. had those. Um, Jesus had them. And I want to I want to real quickly escort a couple of elephants <laughs> out of the room uh, be, before we go any further. Uh, one being the deaths of these two men. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, shot on the balcony outside his hotel room. Jesus was crucified. Right. Both Jesus and Martin Luther King Jr. were killed for their stance. Okay? That, that fact is not lost on me. Martin Luther King Jr. was 39 years old when he died. Jesus was 33 so yes, we acknowledge that, that culture, authority, opposition can be not only ruthless, but deadly. Um, I studied one website this week that had the title, Eight Times in Scripture When People Tried to Kill Jesus. And finally they succeeded. So just putting that out there in case for, for any reason, if you might have any aspect, you're coming into this with saving my own skin, if, if that's like your primary objective. You're probably not going to enjoy all this because that's, that's not the main goal with this. There are some things, in fact, that are bigger than physical earthly life. Um, this is First Peter 3, 13 and 14. Who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. And that you may remember, it's written by a man who was, like his Lord, crucified. He said, I'm not worthy. Tradition says they crucified him upside down. You know? Death can be, could be a result of a run-in with the authorities. Okay? Second one under that part, this, this sermon, is we're not talking about trying to escape deserved punishments. Okay? Um, this is not a sermon on how to teach you to like stand up to the boss because you did something stupid at work and you're trying to get out of what you rightfully deserve. Uh, this sermon doesn't have a subtitle, you know, like five bullet points to get out of paying taxes to a corrupt government. Okay? The idea for this is not how to use your parents' belief in Jesus against them to get away with what they label sin. This, this, the, that, that, the guilt aspect is pointedly addressed again, Peter's writings. Um, if you're getting grief for, for something being wrong, you deserve it. It's 1 Peter 2, 19 and 20. For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? That, that's not the, the topic. Paul wrote the same thing in Romans 13, talking about government. Government's main role to protect the innocent and punish the guilty. Chapter 13, verse 3. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. You want to be free from the fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. 
for he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. So yes, we will want to back you if and when you take a stand against something that human authorities call right, and we know it's wrong, and God calls it sin. Uh, we're going to encourage you in opposing authority then, <laughs> but this, it's not when, you, when any of us are in trouble because we rightly deserve it. You know, what we are talking about um, is this. It, it's especially when believers stand up for the faith, we're, we're standing firm in the face of opposition, especially opposition that's coming at you because you're a Christian. And, and just like we had in the sermon last week, there are numerous examples in the Gospels where Jesus has interactions, run-ins even, with people in authority. Um, one of the, the calmer examples would be Jesus and Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Um, there's some things Nicodemus ignorant about, but, but it, there's, you know, there's questions and answers back and forth. But the, that whole thing appears very civil. Um, no one's spitting. There's no beatings. Um, uh, there's a little bit more volume, I think, that comes out of Jesus when he's calling out the leaders in Matthew chapter 23. He starts out speaking um, to the people in verse 2 and 3. The teachers of the law... And the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. That's the place of authority. So you must obey them and do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they don't practice what they preach. <laughs> this is going to be a run-in, isn't it? This is, um, it, it? If you do that, you start a conversation at work or school tomorrow, you know, hey, you know, we have to listen to the boss or, or the teacher, uh, but don't be like him or her. That's... <laughs> You're, you're probably gearing up for something there. And, and Matthew 23, is, that's the chapter where Jesus just lists off woe. There are seven woes. To the, woe to you, woe. And these are the words that's in red ink in some Bibles of Matthew 23, 33. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? You know, I don't know if you've ever wanted to yell that at anybody. <laughs> you know, like um, maybe like a... a I don't know, a demanding coach, maybe, I don't know, a Budinsky neighbor, you know, if you have any of those. And, and I'll caution you on this, it, it may be very true, um, but I'm not Jesus and neither are you. you know. um, one, of, one of my favorite run-ins Jesus has is, is the questioning he gets in, in Mark 11, beginning with verse 27. And in, by Mark 11, it's the final week of Jesus' life. They've already had the triumphal entry um, you know, the big parade and all his friends and fans and the palm leaves and Hosanna. So he has quite the following, and he's being followed. Um, <clears throat> it says, they arrived again in Jerusalem, and while Jesus was walking in the temple courts, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders came to him. By what authority are you doing these things? They asked. And who gave you authority to do this? Jesus replied, I'll ask you one question. Answer me. And I will tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. And if you know that interaction, they answer with a lie. They, they talk about it, and they're like, we don't know. <laughs> and Jesus says, yeah, neither will I tell you. <laughs> His answer is, you do know, you're not telling me. G Jesus had numerous run-ins with, with authorities, leaders that we could study. Uh, these are some of the numbers from the 1964 Nobel Prize biography of Martin Luther King Jr. Peace Prize. Um, he was arrested upwards of 20 times. He was assaulted four times and his home was bombed. So yeah, it, it, if, when, you and I care to venture into or, or, or wade into this aspect of, of faith living, which is standing up to an authority who is in error, yeah, I, I think we'll find plenty of opportunities for conflict. And, and I'm still searching, researching as we're, we're going through this series. Um, I'm, I'm going to offer this. If, if I don't know, if, if this is your favorite topic, if we spend three months, you know, talking about the, the foundational aspects of faith life, and we talk about 
prayer and grace and dealing with stress and freedom and hope and conquering death. And I don't know, maybe you come back to me in three months and go, yeah, I really like the one where we picked fights with people. You know, that's, um, that's, I don't know, that's just not the way I'm wired. Um, it's, it's a necessary evil. Right? Jesus was willing. I don't think he was eager. I don't think he woke up first thing in the morning. I hope I get a fight with somebody today. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. was willing. We know many of his strategies, his practices were promoting peaceful protests. You know? And I'll, I'll share this. The very same Jesus, who's very vocal with the religious leaders in Matthew 23, will become stone silent when facing words from politicians like Pilate. Um, this is Matthew 27, verse 14. But Jesus made no reply not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. And I think most of us are aware of the abuse that Jesus endured prior to the agony of the cross. He's allowing these soldiers to mock him and spit on him and beat him and inflict pain. That's why I, that's why I suggest this is foundational Jesus. Yes, you can say th this is how Jesus responded in Matthew 23. And this is how Jesus responded in Matthew 27. And I, I think maybe for us one of the best ways to address this further is let, let's take a cue from an outline from a sermon I found from a man named Stephen Sizer. I don't know him. I believe he must be British because his language had some of the British spellings in it. That I, that I recognize. But he's looking at Luke chapter 6. If you want to turn to Luke 6, 1, how Jesus faced opposition. This is the text, Luke 6, 1 to 11. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples began to pick some heads of grain, rub them in their hands, and eat the kernels. Some of the Pharisees asked, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered them, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. And, and then Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man with the shriveled hand, Get up and stand in front of everyone. So he got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? He looked around at them all and then said to the man, stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was completely restored. But they were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. And I liked what Steve Sizer did. He asked this question. He said, did you catch the opposition in that? Can, can you notice the strategy of the opponents of Jesus? And the first thing they did was, he said, stalked. They stalked his disciples in verse 1 and 2. Because you can see that image that Jesus and his disciples are walking through the grain field and the Pharisees are right there close enough to watch everything they're doing. Verse 7, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely. How closely do you think some people were watching Martin Luther King Jr. in the 60s? Followers is the name of the game today. I, I think we understand that with social media. But I, it's, sometimes it's hard to limit your followers to just your friends. <laughs> um, cyber stalking it is a thing today. How, man, how much of what we say and do is not only watched by somebody, but it's recorded and preserved. Most of it. That's why, that's why I love that teddy bear goal. <laughs> Something positive went viral. I was happy. You know, and I, don't, I would hope that stalking is a strong term in our world, but I think we all know people are watching you. People are watching you at work. They're watching you at school. 
if you're serving, if you're walking with Jesus, just be prepared to be followed. Um, second one is they criticized his behavior. Verse 2, they're asking him, why are you doing what is unlawful? And, and we, you read 3, 4, Jesus actually counters their erroneous thinking. <laughs> He's like, well, truth be told, your, your enforcement of the rules are faulty. It's kind of like I'm right and you're wrong, but we see how this thing plays out. And, and again, that, that's one of the downsides of people watching our every move. I mean, you've been there as well. People make no comment on the 87 games when you did not get a technical or get thrown out. But be the parent that's asked to leave the gym or the sidelines one time. That will never be forgotten. Yeah. People are always checking our behavior. Why, why'd you do that? Hmm? Want to check the tape? Which I do kind of like those... Is it progressive? Do we need to watch the replay commercials <laughs> you know, where the people throw the, the challenge flag and they have to bring out the video and rewatch their own mistake again? You know, that this, I, this is a great tool of the enemy to subdue us. Just don't do it because everything's going to be watched. You know, and somebody's going to criticize. You know, somebody's going to criticize our behavior. And I kept this. This is a one-liner from Dabo Swinney, Clemson's football coach. Never worry about criticism from people you wouldn't seek advice from. Three, his opposition condemned his values. Why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? And Steve Sizer said, for them, doing things right was more important than doing right things. Their rules and their traditions about what you could and couldn't do on the Sabbath mattered more to them than the Spirit and the Scripture. And I'm, I'm going to trust, I'm going to assume that most of us know that as soon as we walk out these doors, as soon as you go into the week, you are going to encounter some people who do not share your values. And when Jesus refused to be intimidated because of that, or he didn't back down because of that, he had run-ins and, and conflicts, and so will we. To the d degree for them, the, the fourth level with Jesus here in Luke 6 is they conspired to destroy him. They were furious with one and began to discuss what they might do. And again, Mark's account is a little more pointed on this. Mark 3, 6 says this, The Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. So again, hopefully we are not to the point where someone is plotting to kill us because of our stand for Jesus, but it has happened. Well, as far as discussing what they might do... Um, Luke's wording, I, I bet you've had that, whether you know it or not. You know, you're working diligently while the boss is away. You're going to be talked about by some of your coworkers. What are we going to do with him or her? You know, you're the kid at school that's, I don't know, sitting with somebody in the cafe, or you're just posting something for someone that you know <clears throat> is getting you know, stuff online, um, refusing to let chat, is it chat, GPT, or some other AI, do your homework to cheat, you know, you're, you're, you're going to have classmates who are discussing you, you know? and if, you're, if your efforts start to hone in on somebody's sense of power, they feel like their positions, they're, they're going to want to remove you, you know, and what Steve Sizer did in his sermon was to counter how Jesus responded to the opposition, which is key for us. Uh, the first one that he noted was Jesus counters their hypocrisy with scripture that's that paragraph in verse three have you never read what david did when he and his companions were hungry he entered the house of god taking the consecrated bread he ate what is lawful only for the priest to eat you can see that written there jesus jesus looks at these very educated students of the law and he says haven't you read and you know of course we've read they're all ticked we've read it we know it it's like yeah, you missed the point. You know? And I will admit this, is, this may seem initially ineffective if the opponent that you have is not a person of faith. I, I get that. <laughs> I can see someone going, so this is what you're telling me. You know, I, I go into work, and my boss storms into my work area and just starts just reaming me out, just calling me every name in the book, and you're going to quote Matthew 27 to me, Jesus got spit on and said nothing. What, what, what I am wanting us to, to get from this is to say that Scripture is available to us. 
And, and scripture is, in fact, our best weapon in an attack. And it's a offensive. When you talk about the sword of the Spirit, that's an offensive weapon. We, we always go to Ephesians 6, which is the armor of God, and it's the only offensive weapon, but that's the Scripture. If, and if, by chance, your opponent is a person of faith or does accept Bible or God, by all means, be willing to quote chapter and verse. That's why we challenge you to study, read daily, memorize, it's not just to fill your head, that's to sharpen your sword. Because some people need stuck, <laughs> politely. <laughs> you know, um, not with the back of your hand you know, or a bullet, but with the Word of God. And I, I am wholly confident of this. The Word of God is it's going to endure, it will. Some of the, the hot button topics, some of them, <clears throat> they're going to be in the trash bin of culture before some of you guys die. Some, some of this stuff that, that people are just trumpeting and uh, celebrating, it's going to be proven for what it is, ineffective, untrue, and harmful. Because it runs counter to Scripture. Just, do you, some of us, were, you remember when our enlightened culture thought smoking was all the rage. You can't read the fine print, but it says, give your throat a vacation. Smoke a fresh cigarette. That was the, the line of... Influencers were doing it. <laughs> they would have their guys up there. Must be okay. The stars are doing it. Let me, let me put it on another side. Here's a screenshot of findings from the Institute for Family Studies 2020. I know you can't read the two, the black highlight box that says this. Fewer than 40% of American high schoolers have ever had sexual intercourse. That's a decline of a full 15 percentage points since the early 1990s. It says share that. Then the next one. While popular TV shows like Euphoria and Riverdale depict an increasingly sexualized high school experience, the reality is just the opposite. America's teens today are more buttoned up than ever before, which I say, keep it up, you know, or keep it on. Um, <laughs> Hebrews 13.4, marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexual... Scripture's just never going to lie. It behooves us to be able to share that. The second thing Jesus did was to challenge their motives with substance. I, I, this is the key for me. I like this concept. Um, it's, the, it's the second encounter, another Sabbath, um, day of worship, Jesus willingly engages, and he stands up, and they have the questions. Everybody's kind of back and forth. And then here's the key thing. He heals the man. Okay? So do you think the people walked out of the synagogue that day discussing the debate points at all? Not at all. They talked about, he healed that guy, because that's the substance. You know? In Acts chapter 4, verse 16, Jesus' disciples very wisely took this page out of his playbook. Peter and John do the same thing. They go into the temple. They heal a guy that's been crippled. And everybody sees him. Everybody knows <laughs> that's what the leaders say in 416. What are we going to do with these men? Everybody living in Jerusalem knows they have done an outstanding miracle, and we cannot deny it. He's right there. That's where I want to be. That's where I want to be in the middle of some of this fighting, fussing, argument, opposition. What substance am I bringing to the table? And I will grant you that the Internet has amazing amounts of influence power. People are led multiple ways by things that we read and see. But how many times when the bullies and some of the opinions are exposed and unwrapped, there's no substance to what they're throwing at you. I would love to find some, I got to have a really rich person who will promise between now and the election in November, between now and then, if I could find somebody that would pay me five dollars Every time I have to listen to a celebrity or an athlete tell me what they think of a candidate, I'll be able to retire. And sometimes you just say, what is the substance of that? Which if, if you want to know why our church works so diligently to be a host for community gatherings, it's, it's, it's this thing right here, substance. Is it wear and tear on the facility? Yes, it is. 
Does it require some funds? Yes, it does. But when we come up against opposition for our stances, and it will come, I am hoping that the people who have benefited from our efforts will be able to say, hey, you, know, you might disagree with their stance, but they back up their teaching with generosity. They share their resources. They are supportive of the community. And what we're trying to create, we'll, we'll say it's called Serve Saturday, probably in May. Just be up in the village. Have a shirt on the back, so Serve Alec. Put our logo on it. Anybody else, any business, any other church, well, let's come up here. We're going to work together. Substance. You know, working on somebody's gutter. You know, and, and they'll say, hey, I, I know those people at that church. They're the ones that volunteered and took care of my roof. Substance of faith. And the, and the same efforts that benefit our church corporately or collectively <clears throat> will benefit us individually. It, when you're at, you're at work and you hand uh, an envelope of money <clears throat> to somebody who's out there, um, their coworker whose family's struggling, you know, you're, you're sitting with a kid sharing something online and you know they're being ridiculed. That, that's the substance. Taking the time to shovel your neighbor's walk, that, that's the substance. Yeah. Last one that Steve had. He said, he, Jesus channeled his passion into saving. And, and Mark's account of this, again, is more pointed in Mark chapter 3, verse 5, it says this. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Do, do you think Jesus was like right on the verge right there? He's, he's looking around at them, and I don't know if you've ever looked at somebody with just distress and anger. And they're so stubborn. And where do we usually go next? We usually just... It just explodes. Let's, let's have a fight. And Jesus is able to channel all that energy into making somebody else's life better. And how, how do I handle opposition? God has this insistence from Romans 12. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Well, take revenge. Don't be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. <laughs> how, how many times is that one a lot easier to say than it is to do? And I hate to assume... But, but I really believe you and I are probably both going to be given opportunities this week to live this out, to make that very same choice. You know, you just see, oh, so-and-so wants to go at it again. Here they are, the keyboard warrior, and you're like, I'm just going to. And then you get, no, I'm going to stop this time. I'm going to let that slide. I'm going to go over here to my kid's bedroom door and want to talk to them and say, what was the best part of your day today? Because I'm of a mind that, the, that this is the same energy that drives a lot of people. And some of these people don't care about faith things at all. But they want to save. They want to save the planet or they want to save the pets. Um, people are very passionate. I don't know, maybe we're wired by God to want to, to try to help save people. I, I'm sure you know somebody in that club. They are super passionate. They pour in all of this energy. They give hours and money. And you say, man, if I could channel that into saving someone's life for eternity, they need me to be an example of that. They, they need us to set the bar. Here, here's a, this is a good way to respond to opposition, even as I'm just looking at them in anger and I'm right on the verge, who can I help? Who and who, how can I make somebody's life a little bit better? I, I think this is one of the hardest ones on this list for three months, because Jesus was perfect, and I am certainly not. And he had lots of run-ins. And we will too. And our opponents are going to employ these and other strategies. They may not always be godly strategies, but they're effective if I'm not aware of, of what they're doing. You know, the, the best thing I think I can do this week is to see Jesus standing in that synagogue, in that scene. He sees them all. He sees his opponents. They just want to fight. Then he sees this man that he can help. And he sees all the people who are watching. And I, I think if I can develop that kind of vision 
it's going to improve the results of my run-ins. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for your strength, wisdom, endurance, thick skin. Uh, We pray for your guard over our words and our thoughts. And we are well aware that our enemies will certainly oppose us, whether directly or indirectly. We are faced with challenges, uh, situations, emotions, uh, moments where we have to choose. And we pray that we would choose that which would be in line with your will and that which would help someone to come to know you better. Uh, May our eyes be open to your example. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And we are going to close this portion of the service with an invitation, <clears throat> which is, this is one of those songs that I like the song, but it's also one of the sad, I, I don't want to say saddest songs, but it's, it's one of the saddest thoughts for me, almost persuaded. You're going to sing a whole song of, you can just hear someone who was pretty close. You know, I, I was almost ready, but not. So please consider that as we stand. Let's stand together and we'll sing Almost Persuaded. We're grateful for you to be here with us today. Um, if you want to come tonight at 6, is that what we put in the bulletin? 6 o'clock, we're going to just get some stuff ready to take to work on crafts and things for the kids in Africa. I know Carrie had a note here on grit, don't quit. So, ladies, if you are part of that study and ready for the next session, your copies of your workbook are up here for that beginning this Thursday. Thursday. 630. 6.30, okay. 6.30 here, Thursday. Is there anything else? I do hope you'll encourage our guest preachers when I'm gone. Bruce Slagle, the last two Sundays, you may remember Bruce works on the staff at Heath Church of Christ, and he'll be here. Next Sunday, our own Aiden Bowman is going to come and share a message with you. So please encourage him. Encourage our young people. I know there are um, some of our young people, whether they're like paid time like we do or just you know coming into the service of the king it's it's a challenge for all of us and um, i'm thankful for 
all the years of experience we have, but sometimes I think, I'm almost to the end. I can gut it out. But for the guys that are just coming into it, just lift them up for, you know, just serving with all the opposition that they face in the church. So appreciate your prayers for them. Is there anything else? Would you close us? Let's pray. Father God, I I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we've had to come this morning uh, to gather together to just uh, worship. And Father, I just pray that you help us to uh, each and every day worship you, each and every day uh, do the best we can to live for you, and Father, to always let you lead and guide, and Father, to be more of you and, and less of me. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's close with the King is Coming. Sound.